friends, fabulous to have you with us. Uh, James, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you may say, dear viewers, that I'm doing this out of liturgical order because, of course, we're anticipating, looking forward to uh, Easter Day and Celebration of Resurrection. But, of course, we've got to go through Good Friday and um, mm, uh, yeah. Easter Saturday as well. However, as we will notice in this reading, of course, the fact that we meet every Sunday, Sunday, not Saturday, to worship God together actually mm. celebrates Jesus' resurrection, does it not, James? It does indeed, because that is the that is the day of resurrection. And that, that it seems, is, is the sole reason why the uh, Christians from earliest times have, res have, have worshipped together on the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day being the, the Lord's Day of resurrection, which indeed. is the first day of the week. We get a, we get a reference to the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1. So we indeed. Do, that's yeah. early yeah. traditional Jewish. And, of course, when we say the first Christians, what we mean is the Jewish followers of Jesus Messiah. Indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. And given that... Sabbath observance was one of the four great pillars of Judaism in the first yes. century. Yeah. It must have taken something seismic. Oh, to yeah. have shifted that. Yes, absolutely. I've always thought that is it's it's absolutely huge, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, along with the food laws and uh the land yeah. and the temple, yeah. you know, yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. it is, it is. Good. Uh well, I mean, having <laughs> I got over my little liturgical greeting at the beginning there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, James, where are we? Well, we're at we're well, Easter Day, I mean, uh, Resurrection Day, as, as we should call it. Um, Christ is risen. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and this year is the year of Mark, so we're in Mark chapter sixteen, uh, verses one to eight. It's always a it's always an option to to uh, read from John, but uh, it's good to challenge ourselves with yeah. Mark. John is very attractive uh, gospel resurrection account to yes, preach on, yes. but Mark has some 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 riches in yeah, there which yeah. which we should explore. So we're going to do we Mark sixteen. Yeah. yeah. And friends, if you want to read about John twenty, or you want to watch the video we made last year, then we'll add a link down below. So yeah, do yeah. Um, it is also tempting because, of course, Mark is, uh, the, the, the Johannine account in uh, the fourth gospel in John twenty is, um, it's detailed. It's yes. incredibly carefully structured and crafted, yeah. and it's very full of ideas and compelling yeah. sort of stuff. And it's also quite long, whereas this is very short. We're only looking at yeah, yeah, six, yeah, eight yeah. verses. We're looking at sort of seven and a half verses, really, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Yeah, no, John is actually resonant with with images and stuff. But whereas Mark is, well, Mark is Mark as 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 Mark ever is. Um, yeah, dense, yeah. brief, direct. Yeah, full of energy. Yeah, just a bit like you, really. Well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that people are always <laughs> people are always saying that about me, aren't they? <laughs> Great. Okay. Okay. Well, well, that... <laughs> okay. Focus on the text. Focus. Yes. yes. Um, so let's let's look at Mark sixteen. Uh, we've got. Indeed. By the way, we have got a question immediately when we look at the ending of Mark's gospel. The question: yeah. of the ending of Mark's gospel. But we'll come to that at the end. I think. Yes, that seems like a reasonably logical place to talk okay, about that. So, yeah. so in okay. friends, in bated breath in anticipation, what we're going to say about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Mark 16, verse 1. When the yeah. Sabbath was passed, uh, yes. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices they might go and anoint him. Now, we've already got, uh, in you know our usual customary um, way of dealing with Mark, we've got a couple of really interesting things to notice there. The first is about timing, isn't it? When yeah. the Sabbath was passed, now... One of the big issues, I think, in reading the gospel narratives and particularly in relating them is recognizing the different timescales that are used. So, I mean, for instance, one of the things we just forget is that um, there were three different ways of counting days. So you could yes. say the Jewish way from evening to the following evening. You could count it from morning to the following morning, or you could, I think the Roman way, count it from midnight to the following midnight. So mm. And, and and that's different from you know most of those are two two or three of those two of those three ways of doing it are different from what we we're used to, and it's yeah. worth remembering here that when the Sabbath has passed, that means actually that's Saturday evening. It is yes, it's sunset. I mean, Sabbath was was sunset to sunset, wasn't it? And mm. so so this is they they go out as soon as the shops open on or if it's the well, so as soon as trade was allowed again on the Sabbath, yes. they go out to obtain the spices. Uh, and so that so that part is happening on the Saturday night, and then the the, the following uh, the following action happens on the uh, in the morning, the Sunday or Sunday what we call Sunday morning. Now yeah. there is some interesting connection with the earlier part of Mark's narrative, isn't there? Because we've got the account mm. of Joseph and about the desire for him to be anointed, and I think there's just some interesting things about the language here, which is that in Jewish burial there would be um, the use of solid spices and things. Yeah. Uh, but there'd also be use of liquid things. So certainly, I mean, Dick France in his commentary points out that 
the language here is about not embalming in a sort of an Egyptian sense. No, no. But but anointing him with liquid. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting, isn't it? And of course, that immediately takes you back to that instant in Mark 14 with the uh, woman of Bethany who anoints Jesus mm. for burial in advance, doesn't it? Yeah. So you've you've got you've got that uh, going on here, um, but of course the the women don't don't ever end up using any of the spices. So so uh, no, indeed, interesting. Which well, is not, not at least not for Jesus. No, not for Jesus. Which is a classic piece of Mark and irony, really, that that he's already been anointed yeah. by by the woman he says has anointed him for burial, yeah. and 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 that that has already been done. It doesn't need to happen again, and it, it and as it turns out, it's not necessary. Yeah. yeah, you've got a good quotation from Morna Hooker on that. I think, I yeah, think. she she had a wonderful a wonderful comment on this. She says that the women fail to do belatedly what was in fact done by another woman prematurely. Her action was a prophetic sign of Jesus' death. Theirs is made impossible because of his resurrection. Mm. So that's quite a yeah, quite, quite quite something. And interestingly, as often with the Gospels in general, but particularly with Mark both we make sense of the later account in the light of the earlier but we also then need to make sense of the earlier account in the light of the later so i mean in fact yeah. jesus is saying about she's done this for my death is actually slightly enigmatic but of course yeah. in a sense now we see the the completion of that anticipation yeah absolutely yeah i think the list of um, women is interesting as well isn't it though the the it is yeah yeah and because it's a, bit it's, of a puzzle as well it is because you 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 think who we know who Mary Magdalene is uh, that's fine yeah. um, but Mary the mother of James well, although just to just to note that Mary Magdalene is isn't is she named earlier or not she so, is she's she's named in in fifteen forty uh, uh, just um, a few verses before so it, indeed what well, I'm saying she's not named actually earlier she's not I don't think she's named earlier in in Mark is she and that's the same a, the same is true in John twenty where she, she appears at the tomb and actually we 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 don't know who she is from the earlier narrative mm, mm. perhaps John is assuming the fourth gospel right the fourth gospel assuming we have read Mark and therefore we in, indeed it. indeed which quite 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 possible as we've mentioned yep. in, in previous times but yep. this list here seems to be um a parallel to the list in in 1540 where we hear of Mary uh, Magdalene Mary, the mother of James and Joses and Salome, yeah. and here it, it, the the text is very slightly different, but but just Joses is left is is missed out. But it seems to me that there's a, this is a sort of um, bottom bread of a of a typical Mark and sandwich, where yeah. you've got the story of the women, um, and in the middle you've got the story of Joseph of Arimathea going to Pilate and asking for the body. Yeah, and if you've got a Mark and sandwich, and you have to ask yourself. Well, what what is the either what is the common theme that's being emphasised, yeah. or what is the contrast that's being emphasised? Yeah. Um, and I think I mean I, I I think there are two views on this one. I mean um, James Edwards reckons that what's actually being contrasted is the women's fearfulness and anxiety with mm. Joseph's boldness, boldness in going to Pilate. So mm. you've got a lot of stuff, haven't you, about the yeah. women's anxiety, particularly in in verse eight. Yeah. Um, but it also in in in, in verse uh, forty. Yeah, in account, counting the young man, there that also is a lot of language of fear. Yeah. yeah exactly. And in fifteen forty, you have the women looking on from a distance. He, he points oh, yeah. out yeah. this is an an anxious looking on from yeah. a distance. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got Joseph's bold. It actually says boldly. Um, he he went boldly to Pilate and asked for the the body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So so that that could be one contrast. And I think if that's so, the kind of women come off quite badly in that sense and in, in, in we'd, be, we'd be interesting to explore that in the sense that although maybe there are two there are two aspects of discipleship going on here you know that you yeah. can both be bold and fearful and still be a disciple of jesus i don't know that's an interesting thought but well, then the they, other they, issue but they're, but they're also being faithful and they are going but they're being, exactly faithful. they're being faithful so that there's yeah. it's it's not all about the uh, anxiety yeah. i think the other interesting thing is that if, if you wanted to look for some common ground here what is really uh, marked, I think, is that both of these groups uh, are looking for, uh, looking to care for the physicality of Jesus. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. Um, it that is. The, the physical body of Jesus is important, and of course, yes. that becomes important in the whole resurrection count. We Christian belief has always affirmed the physical resurrection of Jesus. Yes, That's fundamental. It is, and, and that comes through very strongly in all. Uh... All, all aspects of the narrative actually what, it what does we as we go yeah. on yeah yeah so that seems quite a, i think that's quite likely too but there's another little puzzle here which is that i mean you mentioned uh, 1540 which lists mm. those three people but we also got verse 47 so the, the immediate preceding verse at the end of the chapter yes which lists mary magdalene mary the mother of joseph so and then 
and then 16 one says mary the mother of james but the verse 40 had said mary the mother of joseph and, and joseph and james and james yes now of course yeah. the question is well which mary is this by the way worth noting that there are an awful lot of marys around i think i think richard borkham's account says that something like one fifth of all the women were called mary so in, in in that yeah in that time, in that time, that time yeah, i think that's right yeah. Mir miriam so miriam yeah, yeah. Presumably after the sister of moses yeah um so so you have to always identify uh, a Mary by the by topography, possibly Magdalene, yeah, uh, or by their husband, Mary of somebody, or by their sons, which is happening in this case. Yeah. Um. So I've I've got a feeling. Let me just look at the text here. Uh. Yeah. This simply says Mary Maria of Jacob and of Jacob of, of James. Um. Now, who? What are the, What Marys do we already know of from Mark's Gospel? Who is the mother of someone called Joseph and James? Yeah, it's 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 Mary the mother of Jesus. Yeah, it is because because Mark lists them. I think it's in chapter six, wasn't it? Mark lists. Yeah, the, yeah I think that's right. So isn't that fascinating? That the logical inference there is that this is Jesus's mother, but is not referred to as Jesus. Jesus's mother. No, no, it's very puzzling. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if any com friends, if you've got an idea of why that is, or yeah. if you think that's unlikely. But I mean, Mark doesn't use names a lot. So the no, he doesn't. That, he certainly doesn't list them like this. Uh, no, and the fact that he uses no. them here, and there's the connection back to chapter six and back to verse forty in, in the previous chapter, it, it, it does seem significant, doesn't it? It does. It really does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, also interesting to note, very good Grove booklet on this, on about narratives and names um, in the Grove booklet in biblical series uh, about looking at characterization in the Gospels, and just notice that. Mary, the mother of Jesus, does not come off very well. It's not depicted very strong no. in the narrative. No, so no, she no. tells Jesus to do something in John 2 when he shouldn't do it. And, uh, you know, in Matthew 12 and Parallels, she's very sceptical about his ministry. So, And, in, and earlier on in Mark, um, she, uh, she, she, she thinks he's mad. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. It, again, fascinating, isn't it, that Jesus's earthly family have no privileged position amongst the disciples. No. No, so no, it's because only when, it's only when they come to faith that they become yes, part of this. It, it, it's the it's the family of the kingdom of God that is uh, completely over, overwhelms all other claims, all other yeah. all other ties. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've done verse one. Good. <laughs> <laughs> verse two, and very early on the first day of the week, when the yeah. sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Just a little bit of a paradox there. I think this is a paradox we find in all the accounts about exactly what the time is. I mean. Yeah. When you're in, un, unlike in Britain, you're further south here. Therefore, yeah. when the sun rises, it does so quite quickly. So yeah. those sort of moments, just as the sun is rising and it's it's getting lighter, and then suddenly the sun is up and you can see everything. I mean, uh, uh, his first Mark's first time reference there very early suggests that it's still dark, but actually the sun's already risen. So yeah, they, they can see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think I think that doesn't there doesn't there isn't really a sense of tension because I think the, the account instance in John twenty has the same sort of ambiguities, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, and then they've been saying to one another, don't they? they yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who will roll away? Uh, yeah, this is this is their first sort of yeah. Their their anxiety comes to the fore. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And that's I think that's fascinating that that's commented on by by Mark because. The, the, you you do immediately wonder well where are the male disciples surely surely you would have taken a male disciple but of course the male disciples are probably in hiding and yeah. that's what we that's what mark has indicated up at yeah. this point they, yeah. they all desert him and flee yeah. and so the, the women are left in in contrast that despite their fear and anxiety they still feel a duty of service towards the the, yeah. the physical body of jesus which i think is really extraordinary mm -hmm. um but it's also uh, it, it's a classic kind of line, isn't it? Um, they, you can just hear them chatting about it, can't you? I don't know about you, but I, I do feel that's quite, you know, uh, I can hear that conversation. And again, it's the sort of thing where you you can imagine that in a situation of stress and distress that yeah. they just haven't thought this through. It's a bit like, you know, you're, you're preoccupied yeah. with something, you go out of the house and you realise you haven't got the car key with you, for example. I yeah. mean, that's a trivial example, but yeah. but but it, it it seems very, very, very normal. Um yes. Do they it's just have they haven't even thought about this? Yes, it's almost a mundane detail, isn't it? Which, which yeah. once again gives an authenticity to the account. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm. And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. Quite interesting there. No description of who's done it, and no. 
a kind of implication of a divine passive. It's just it's just been done. Yes. Um, and of course, it was very large, which was what did you expect? Because if you go and look at any of the tombs, I mean, obviously, the most the most obvious one is the garden tomb in Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, but but it's not alone in examples. And if you've got a doorway and you've got, again, quite a lot of popular depictions are of the stone as a as a round boulder. But in fact, it mm. wouldn't have been that. It would have been carved as a disc because then it rolls in a groove. Yeah. But it's pretty substantial. If you've got a doorway to walk in, you have to stoop down to walk in. We know that from yes. the account in John 20 and, and from yeah. an archaeological example. I think, yeah, exactly. But even yeah. a stone to cover that is going to be pretty substantial. It's still pretty big. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, interesting. This is very abbreviated. And I think it, it, it is mm. interesting, isn't it? Reading this in kind of, not parallel with, but in complement to uh, the John 20 account. Um, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Again, some really interesting things to notice there. Um, they have to enter the tomb in order to see it because they have to stoop down to get in the doorway. Yes. Um, and we know that because, again, John 20 says explicitly yes. that yes. the disciple whom Jesus loved stooped down and looked in. Um, and then Peter overtook him. Um, and and a little detail here. The, the the young man. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't use the language of angel. No. But, but also neither does Luke initially. When no. Luke talks about this, no. he talks, he refers to people as, as men and then later as angels. Um, but he's sitting on the right hand side. I don't know why. Yeah. But extraordinary. Detail. It is an extraordinary detail. And, and dressed in white in a dark tomb is an interesting thing, isn't it? it Yes, you you don't see white easily in the dark. No, um, no. I wonder if uh, so. There's a kind of sense in which you're kind of being pointed back to the transfiguration. Yes, um, uh, aren't you? Where there's this brightness, there's this whiteness yeah. that's um, uh, that's so significant. And of course, uh, I mean the angelic nature of this person. I mean that this is a common way of describing uh, angelic angels, figures. Yeah. angelic figures, isn't it? Yeah. And the whiteness is a sign of I mean, generally a sign of the presence of the Holy One, yeah, of, of godliness, of, of the divine, yeah, in, yeah. in the in the in the biblical narratives. So there's, and it becomes it's, important it's, in the Book of Revelation, in chapter seven, where the ones exactly. praising God have, have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And, and, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a, it, there's there's a number of indicators here of the, of the significance of, of yeah. this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think when we go on to his speech as well, this isn't just some chat with a message. This is this no. is somebody with no. a. A divine command, a divine, a divine very much so. Answer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, um, I mean, they're alarmed, but then they get these staccato sentences, which, as you say, feel commanding. They, yeah. he is not to be messed with. He is not to be yeah. argued with. No, no, is he? No. There's absolutely no sense in which there's any room for discussion about any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is, it, it is, it is authoritative in in every way. Yeah. Um. One thing I did, one little detail that I love here, and it's me being a bit quirky, but um, the uh, the verb is uh, ekthambeo to be alarmed. And yes. I love the fact that Luke, uh, Mark says they are ekthambeo, and then uh, the man says he uses the same verb. He says, "Do not be ekthambeo." So it's, yes. <laughs> you are alarmed, but don't be alarmed. <laughs> well, I, I like I like the fact that he uses the exact word which describes their exact condition. It says, "Don't, yes. don't you don't you don't need to be about to be that." So I just sorry that just struck me as quite amusing. Well, it, it, it is interesting. It is amusing, isn't it? Because of course, angels traditionally do say to human beings in scripture, "Do not be afraid." They they nearly always fear say not. that. It's like Mary, fear not. Yeah, yeah. Fear not. But but as you say, he's used the exact language which yeah. Mark used to describe. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating that again he uses the title for Jesus of Jesus of Nazareth. And again, we we see yes. this in, the, in Acts in Peter speaking as well. And you know, it, it this I mean this touches again on as you said on the materiality. This is the this is yeah. the flesh and blood person that you're looking for. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. Earths it doesn't it? And and that he was crucified. Crucified. Yeah, yeah. What is really striking here is the response to, to which turns all of this over that the reversal hinges it's not in english but in greek it's on a single word yeah yeah absolutely yes it, 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 it yeah yeah uh, and and it's just it's interesting that i noticed that the niv uh translates um he is risen does it say he is risen yeah and yes esb says he well it's actually risen. of course it's a passive so well, uh, yes indeed it, it, he has been raised. He ha he can't rise himself. He has been raised by the power of God, right. yeah. which is a really really important theological point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 
Yeah. So he's not. Here. What does he say? One word. One word. On the Amazing. Way. Everything changes. Mm. Um, again, the, the just the specific the specificity of it. See the place where they they laid him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, we're taken back into sort of you know if you know again if, if anyone who's been to the garden tomb or you've seen pictures of it that you know you go in the door typically of a rock hewn tomb yeah. in the door. Yeah. And then you see on either side the places where the bodies were laid. And they'd yeah. be laid there temporarily for a year or two years. The flesh would decay. Then the bones would be gathered and they'd be put in, in ossuaries in pots, which would be put on a shelf. And then you've got room for the next relative who pops yeah, up. It is. Yes. Be laid in as well. So again, and, and also I think this gives this also gives rise to this this repeated metaphor in the New Testament of death being like sleep. Because yeah. it's much that you've been laid out on a bed, as it were. Yeah. In anticipation of resurrection. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just worth noting as well. I mean, you, your comment on this passive verb, it's, it is significant because when Jesus predicts his uh, death and resurrection yes. earlier in the gospel, he doesn't use this word. No. He uses no. an estime to stand up, to, yeah, to, yeah. to to get up, which is the yeah. word that you do, you'd do use when you, when you get up from sleep again. Yeah. So it is, yeah. it is interesting, though. And I think it's, it's also interesting that where it says, look, look, there is the place they laid him. I mean, 1547 is, is quite specific in telling us that the two women, two of the three women, saw where Joseph of Arimathea laid him. So there's there's no doubt at all that this was, you know, so right it's place. reinforcing the, yeah, the, the veracity of the account. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. Mm. And then the command. So this is a, you know, yeah. a divine imperative. Go, yeah. and he's going before you to Galilee. Now, here's an interesting thing. Both looking back where Jesus has just very recently in, in the previous chapter, he's talked about, you know, the shepherd will be, the, 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 the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will flee, mm. but I will be, I'll be going ahead of you to Galilee. And you get the parallel there with Matthew's account, where of course, in contrast to Luke, he encounters them at Galilee. And, and this may be give us, I'm anticipating our discussion about the ending, the lost ending of mm. perhaps mm -hmm. that's where it would go. That if, if, you know, Matthew, Matthew and Mark follow so much closely in parallel in this this part of the story yeah. that we might expect that the, the the gospel would end back in Galilee. Yeah, yeah, and in, and in, in indeed, mm. in, in contrast to Luke and John. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. yep. And again, this phrase, uh, just as he told you. So yeah, in a such a that's such a resonant phrase. It, it's almost it feels like almost like a rebuke, doesn't it? It's um. Uh, I told you so. <laughs> he told you so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And and now and now you, you it's now now is the time to enter fully into believing what he told you. Yeah. It's a, it's that sort of a um yeah. And again yeah. it's connecting the the story back to the previous yes uh, and the reliable the witness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So um now what's really fascinating here again not a little detail which is unique to Mark which is uh, go tell his disciples and Peter. Yeah, he yeah. Was going before you to Galilee. Yeah. Now, what's that about? Is that is that you know is that because Peter needs to be reinstated after his denial? Is it because actually he's been shunned by the other disciples because of it? You, mm. We don't know. It doesn't say that, but no, it, no. It, it must have been uncomfortable for him mm. um, at some level. And um, of course, you do get that reinstatement in the. Accounts in the fourth gospel by the you by do the, exactly exactly you want yeah yeah but of course the other alternative is that you get the registering the 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 the, the phrase registered there because P, if Peter is Mark's source eyewitness source for writing the gospel then it's natural that he might remember that uh, yeah indeed and 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 it is it, it's interesting isn't it um that or if Peter is the source for Mark he's a very humble source because Mark doesn't give him a good he doesn't give him a good. No, he doesn't uh, give him a good. No, he, you know, he doesn't. He doesn't. No, no, he doesn't come. Doesn't come off well. No. Now we're getting to the end of our passage, and it sort of leads into the question of of well, what yeah. happens next, and what did happen to the ending of the gospel? Um, they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Um, something strange going on here in the sense that yes. they've come to do something quite ordinary um something they would do as a matter of routine we've we've seen the emphasis on the sort of physical place the continuity of testimony and yet they've encountered something terrifying uh mm -hmm. um tr transcendent divine 
And so in contrast, I think it's Luke says they were they were afraid, but also full of joy. Or is that Matthew? I can't remember. One of the no. other one of the other synoptic accounts says they go yeah. away afraid, I but think full it of might joy. be Luke actually. I yeah. think it was Luke, but mm -hmm. because joy is a theme of Luke's gospel, yeah. isn't it? But mm. here, there's, there isn't any joy. There is just fear. Yes. Uh, in response to this sort of divine, the sense of divine encounter with this with this man in white. And fear is a is a very common um, experience, indeed terror in in the face of the Almighty. Yeah. So there is a, I mean that that part of it is under, entirely understandable. It's yep. just that it's unmitigated here, isn't it? And it's interesting that what whatever whatever happens here that we it feels like and grammatically it seems like we've ended in the middle of a sentence yeah um, yes because um actually there's a break isn't there although it's not it's not said in english translations but actually there's a semicolon there and it says it says for they were afraid and in fact the word for for gar yes. always comes in a, as a second word in a sentence and here yeah. it is the second word after they were afraid yeah if i yeah. want to so but they were afraid of or it was a, yeah so it looks like it's about to say um they were afraid of something afraid of the authorities yeah. or afraid of yeah who, know, who knows what yeah. that does reinforce i mean it's interesting i mean you comment on the contrast in the sandwich with the naming with with joseph mm. he was mm. bold they were afraid mm. and and yet of course as as you've also pointed out they're doing much better than the male disciples who aren't even there yeah yes so there's a kind <laughs> of a, a, a middle pathway here yeah um what does that then tell us? I mean, there's two things to, to, to discuss. One is what do we make of the longer ending and what it looks yeah. like? And the other thing is to say, well, why do we end up with this sh short ending or this, or this lack of ending, the, the truncated ending? So mm -hmm. I think the first thing to observe about the long ending, um, I'm just looking at the long ending here on my screen, mm -hmm. is that it, it feels very different, doesn't it? It doesn't feel oh, it, like a marker narrative at all. Totally. I mean, the lang the lang anybody who's read Mark up to this point but could not could not mistake this um in any way this this is not the language this is not the kind this is not mark's style at all is it uh, the, the the language and of course and anybody who knows the other gospels is that knows that in in a sense what it feels like is a a bringing together of of material from from the other gospels yep. um to to sort of fill in the gaps which yeah yeah uh, which which has been which has clearly been left and and the shorter ending of mark i mean the you know the um which, which is um also often printed in our bibles yes. is it, it, it is also not it's just the language is it's not i mean you know it Very says grandstanding what, isn't it yeah so, so from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation as i i think i said before it feels a bit like a sort of north and north korean news reader you know where they, they just pile sort of huge adjectives <laughs> one on top of the other and it's also in this very very yeah. kind of upbeat yeah. voice yeah. you know yeah. and uh, so yeah i don't i'm entirely unconvinced that that's the mark and um the the question of course of what happened if there to yeah. to the ending if, yeah. if mark did not intend to end here which i'm convinced he didn't no. i i do think the i do think the most obvious answer to that because it's kind of common to our own experience of books or codexes codices is that the back page fell off <laughs> yes <laughs> The, you dog, know, it could the be, dog ate it for breakfast. The dog ate it, yeah, yeah because yeah. that's the most vulnerable part of a book, isn't it, of, of a codex? So, so. Yes, it is, and I, I don't know what the, pop, the discipline was in terms of having covers and things or not. Whether no, no, I, it would be interesting if somebody knows about that too. Yeah, yeah. Drop a yeah. comment in. Mm. Just, I was looking at um, Dick Francis' commentary. He actually, the, the long one here, the NIG mm. commentary. So again, friends, don't be afraid of long commentaries because on any particular passage, there's, you, you still only have to read a few pages. But yeah. he does have a nice little table here about the long ending. And he just notes all the different the different gospels that it comes from. And there's definitely sort of Lucan language here and there's Johannine language here as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the message is accompanied by signs. Is that a Johannine signs language or is that Lucan signs and wonders? Yeah. Um, so it is it is very interesting um, mm. to see that that sort of composite nature of the language here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but Dick also says something fascinating about this whole the whole feel of the verses one to eight and about the the integration between the sort of mundane and the um divine he says this um a few sentences it's worth reading mm. i'm just talking about the fact that the women have run run away and all. he says this this is not the stuff of heroic epic still less a story of magic and wonder and yet what underlies this is an event beyond human comprehension the jesus they had watched dying and being buried some 40 hours earlier is no longer dead but risen just as he'd said. It is this incongruous combination of the everyday with the incomprehensible that many have found one of the most powerful 
and compelling aspects of the New Testament accounts, not of Jesus' resurrection, for there are none, but of how the first disciples discovered that he has risen. Mm. And, and for me, a part of the reason I find that such a really such an interesting summary is that it's almost as if the way the narrative is shaped is a kind of metaphor for, for discipleship, which is that yes. no, one, no one says, uh, describes Jesus being raised. Well, some of the apocryphal accounts do. Mm. Um, that's not what they see. This is this is this is you're you're not presented, as it were, with a prima facie event. What you're presented with is the circumstantial evidence. The mm. tomb is empty. Mm. The women are fearful. Mm. Eventually, they and the disciples are transformed. The gospel yeah. is preached, mm. and you know through Acts you see that that people recognise these these men are these men have been with Jesus, and now that now they're different. Something's happened to them, mm. Um, mm. and so it, it's an invitation, not as it were, for scientific proof, but about saying, look at the evidence. Now add that up and make a decision. How are you going yeah. to respond to this? And yeah. one of the things that really occurred to me in looking at this narrative again is that just the way that that central event is left undescribed but the consequences and the evidence for it all around are, are set out before us is that yeah. particularly in relation to the tomb the women say well who's going to roll the tomb away they, they find that this sorry who's going to roll the stone away from the tomb mm. they find the stone already rolled away and it suddenly occurred to me just reading this the stone wasn't rolled away to let jesus out no the stone was rolled away for us to look in mm. Mm. yeah absolutely and look at the evidence for ourselves yeah 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 so there we go there's your resources for preaching on easter sunday yeah for christ is risen he is risen indeed hallelujah james thank you very much uh thank for you. joining me today friends thank you for joining us in our discussion oh james we didn't remind people of the four things they should do did we oh yes do do uh click like uh on the videos uh, that helps our uh our promotion oh, um do do uh subscribe to the channel yeah uh, do share on social media do comment uh if you've got any thoughts yeah yeah and above all friends do look into the empty tomb and just hear that word mm. he has been raised mm. look forward to seeing you next time